let me know when we're on there. Well, it's good to be with you. Thank you for joining me. This is Pastor Tom, and I'm doing another study in the Word, another seminar, in-depth teaching, if you will, and there'll be quite a few in this series. I don't know exactly how many, but we'll just get to it as we can. Today, I want to talk about the role of women in the church and, <clears throat> excuse me, society in general. <clears throat> a lot of people are confused over this issue. And it really shouldn't be. It shouldn't be confusing, but it is. And so hopefully we can help you uh, straighten it out. Two scriptures I want to go to. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2. I believe I got that right. We'll see when we get there. But 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and 1 Timothy chapter 2. These, uh, these two scriptures... Uh, that the Apostle Paul wrote by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit have been a reason for much disagreement, much uh, oh, haggling and, and fighting over uh, this subject simply because they've been misunderstood. And really, it simply should never have been like that. This is not rocket science. You do have to study a little bit because... Uh, uh, We'll talk about that in a second, but let me read these to you. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34 says this, Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in church. Now, when you read something like that and you take it at face value, to me, the first time I heard, I went to a church where they believed that women should never be able to teach or speak or, or do any of that kind of stuff in church. And they use this scripture. But there's some things, you know, you just have to kind of listen to your heart. I knew when they were saying that, I said, that doesn't, that doesn't make sense to me, number one. Number two, if you took it at face value, you couldn't have. Women couldn't pray. They couldn't worship. They could, you know. I mean, there's got to be something up about that. And number three, uh, it's just not the character of God uh, to uh, interpret something that holds people in bondage or tries to uh, stop them from advancing spiritually. So it didn't make any sense. And then there's in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Let's go over there and look at that one. And then I'll start making some comments on this and we'll move on from there. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11. Now, let me say this to you before we get started. I've been studying this particular subject literally for 45 years now. And in 45 years, I've learned a lot, a lot about it. And I actually here recently even got some more insight and some uh, revelation into it. So I, I, just hang with me. And if you're the person that has been taught that uh, these things, like women are second-class citizens, so to speak, and they can't really get involved in church uh, except for maybe uh, certain things. Please, please listen to these till the end because they'll bring light. And I've had a lot of people tell me how much, what a blessing they've been to them because they've been sitting there for years, many women, and really been in bondage to this religious idea or this religious teaching. And so I would like you to give it, the teaching, a chance in your life, even if you've been taught differently, all right? In 1 Timothy chapter 2, if we look down here at verse 11, it says, Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor observe authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being uh, deceived was in the transgression. Now, these two scriptures have been taken out of context and things, but let me say this. Uh, some scriptures are a little bit more difficult to translate or understand than others. These certainly are uh, one of those situations and in many Bibles. Uh, some Bibles actually got it right, but sometimes to understand a section of Scripture, 
we have to be careful to follow the laws of biblical interpretation. So I'm going to talk just a little bit about law of biblical interpretation. We'll come back to these here in a minute. First of all, one of the laws of biblical interpretation is that you do not take scriptures out of context. You keep them in context and find out what's really being said, and that needs to be done in this case. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Secondarily, you need to compare scripture with other scripture or rightly divide the word on this particular subject. And this is one of those cases. Thirdly, sometimes we must go back to the original language, be it Greek, Hebrew, some people say Aramaic. But I, I got to tell you, that's important in this particular scripture right here. Because if you don't go back to the Greek and you don't understand what's being said here, uh, you can't discern the prejudice that the translators had. King James Version was the one that everybody kind of followed off after. And uh, unfortunately, in this particular section of Scripture, they, they messed it up pretty bad. So we'll talk about that in a minute. So sometimes we, need, we must go back to the original uh, Hebrew or Greek or whatever it is. Fourth thing I'd like to talk about is we must understand the time that this was written, the culture, the practices of the day, uh, and understand that the Bible is a Eastern book, not a Western book, okay? And the fifth thing is, what are the historical facts that could shed some light on, on the subject in question? Those two kind of run together, but what are the historical facts? What was going on at the time? And the sixth thing is comparing various translations. Various translations can help us out sometimes in these scriptures here. Seventh, we need to run every doctrine through Calvary and God's love. Clearly to me, the way that many people interpret this about women and women's in general in the, in the Bible and the church uh, runs up away from the love of God. Uh, the, God is a God of love. He's a God of liberty. And it, these views hold people in bondage. And God's never into bondage. Satan is the one who does that. So the next thing is when we find we have a wrong viewpoint and our viewpoint has been wrong and we, we see it in the Bible, we have to be willing to repent and change. And I think that many people that are in denominations or fellowships where they believe some of these things about women that aren't, aren't correct do not, they really don't believe it, but they, they, they're, they, they can't say anything because if they do, many times they'll be maybe even kicked out of the denomination because of it or whatever. Well, I believe that we need to be humble enough to admit when we're wrong. I've been wrong. You've probably been wrong. Maybe you never have been. I don't know. But if I find out I'm wrong in a particular area or situation, I'm going to go ahead and change that. And I'll even change the way I teach about that. There's nothing wrong with that. That's called life. We've got to be able to do that. Ninth thing I'd like to point out here, does the doctrinal viewpoint provide scriptural liberty or does it hold people in bondage in a, some kind of a law-like situation? Tenth thing, accept the verdict without questioning God. In other words, when you see it, it clears something up, accept it. And don't sit there and try to fight with it about God or question God or you know, run around trying to find a, an answer that will uh, uh, continually feed what you used to think. These scriptures and others we'll have to look at uh, and, and study, and I've been looking at them again for 45 years at this time of the seminar. So I'm 100% sure today that what I'm going to tell you in, the, in this seminar is the truth, 100%. I've studied this in every way I, I, I could possibly have done it, and I've come to my conclusions not based upon my own opinions, but based upon what the Word of God says and these biblical interpretation ways. So I will say this, the first church I attended taught uh, that women could not preach or teach in public role. Uh, this is a very popular uh, in lighter charismatic type of churches. Uh, the reason was interesting to me always because the leader of this particular denomination or not, or fellowship that I'm talking about, 
came out of the Assemblies of God, which is a traditional mainline full gospel denomination. And there's no churches that treat women with more liberty and respect than full gospel denominational churches. So it's really interesting to me how the leader of that particular group could ever have that viewpoint or get that viewpoint after being taught clearly and getting his credentials through uh, this full gospel assembly of God, actually, is what it was. So what about women in ministry? All right. Well, going back here to these, to these scriptures, let's look at them once again here. Uh, if we look at them uh, uh, a little bit here, we will see something immediately that needs to be brought out. And that's just very, very simple. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if you look at verse 34, let's just look at verse 34. It says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the law. Well, here's the thing immediately that pops out to me. It says, let your women, if you take that at face value, you say all women. This is dealing with all women, but it's really not. Because there is, now write this down. This is important. In the original Greek, there's only one word for, uh, one word tra uh, that you can translate for woman or wife. Only one word. There is not two words and not a word for wife or a word for woman. There's, there's only one. So it's up to the translator to get it right. So, unfortunately, the King James, when that was written, people had a really, really prejudice against women. And society was really, really still bound up. We'll talk about a lot of that stuff. And so when they translated it, of course, they went the wrong way with it. It should read, let your wife keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under law uh, obedience, as also says the law. Now, there's a lot in this scripture we need to study, and we will. But right now, I just want to point out that it should have been tra translated wives. He's not talking to all women. He's talking clearly to wives here. And if you look in First Tim uh, in Timothy, uh, what was the scripture that I see? Let me see. I got that. Uh, First Timothy chapter two. It's the same thing. It's misinterpreted when they put it into the Bible here. 1 Timothy chapter 2, when they translated it into the Bible, and it shouldn't have been like that. So verse 11, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, understand this. There's only one word in the Greek for man or husband. Um, so, same problem here. When we don't look at it the right way, then we think, well, my God, you know, all women need to be subjective to all men. That's not right. So when we read it like this, it makes sense. Let the wives learn in silence with all subjection, but I allow not a wife to teach nor absurd authority over her husband, but to be in silence. And then it goes on and talks about Adam and his wife. Okay, now that makes sense. So we get, we're getting somewhere. He's not talking about all wi uh, women. He's talking about wives. He's not talking about all men. He's talking about husbands. He's talking about husbands in the church setting with their wives. Something clearly was happening that was disruptive. We'll get to that later. So there you go. So what about the woman? Well, these folks, the historical Pentecostals, were the ones who gave women more liberty than any other uh, uh, of the churches. Yet the full gospel uh, uh, churches uh, still today uh, don't restrict women in ministry. And uh, let me just step back and take a look at this from a viewpoint of history. What has been the fruit of the full gospel interpretation of 
women being able to be in ministry as an example. What is the fruit of it? Is the fruit bad or is the fruit good? Well, the truth of the matter is, if you look at biblical history, it's amazing the fruit that's come out of it. All you have to do is go back into the days of early Pentecost uh, in America, and you see uh, Marie Woodworth Edders, how many millions of people she was able to minister to, got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, healed and delivered. You can't, the Holy Spirit will not use, uh, uh, if, that was, if it was wrong for her to be preaching like that, how could the Holy Spirit anoint that? Well, you look at Amy Simple McPherson, who started the whole four square movement, a major denomination. She was the one who started it. God mightily used her. And you go to, and then and then as you come forward this way a little bit, you got Catherine Coleman. You've got just so many, I can't name them all. You got Marilyn Hickey, and you've got Joyce Myers, and you got Gloria Copeland, and you got just, and those are well known ones. Um, thousands of women fivefold ministry women across the world, and many of them are bearing more fruit even than the men are, preachers. And so right there, that shows us something, or should show us something. So I wanted to mention that right off the bat. So who's right on this subject? Well, I always learned to listen to my heart, and when I heard that in that particular place I was in, it, it disturbed me, and I knew something wasn't right, so I, I really got a red flag, and I started studying on the subject for myself to find out, and I found out that it wasn't right what they were saying. Now, here's something that we need to deal with. There's a notion, even today, many people that said, these scriptures that we're, we're reading, and other ones, uh, that Paul wrote, Paul hated women, the Apostle Paul. He was a woman hater, see? So, and that the Apostle Paul, not being married, or never being married, was putting women in their place with these scriptures. And that makes me laugh because it's the opposite of that. We'll talk about that in a minute. But listen carefully, please. At the time of Paul's writing, at this time historically, people of that time simply, and most cultures, almost all cultures, including the Jewish culture, the Muslim culture, the pagan culture, you pick a culture, it doesn't matter. They all treated women as second-class citizens, slaves, dogs, or worse. Women had no rights. Women couldn't vote. They couldn't do business unless they were helping their husband. There's a thousand things. Women were restricted from public worship. I mean, you just go down a long list. Women basically would have the children, take care of the children, work their fingers to the bone, take care of the man. And in most of those cultures, when the man didn't like her anymore, she got a little bit older, they would many times just cast them out and get another one. Sometimes these men would have harems of women. They had enough money. And so women all over at that particular time, still today in some places, but at that particular time everywhere, were uh, treated completely differently than men. Men ruled the roost. And women had a suburban role that was really terrible. So women uh, were given the role as basically just the area of, of seeing over the home and fixing the food and keeping the man happy. In most cultures, if a man was at, uh, wasn't happy, he could, uh, as I said, dump his wife for a new one anytime. He got a wild hair and a lot of these poor women, they were left without any source of income whatsoever and had to become prostitutes, literally. The only thing they could do to survive. So that put them in a very, very difficult situation. It was terrible, absolutely terrible. And this is just a historical fact. So there you go. So the Apostle Paul, when he started writing these things, he wasn't, he wasn't a woman hater. He was writing to a culture that had been affected for many, many years about this. And he was slowly, you can tell, God was slowly, through the word of God, bringing more and more liberty to women. As we go, we'll see that. So, it wasn't a pretty picture. There was a lot of abuse, is what I'm trying to say, with men or husbands to their wives, so on. Young girls could be married at a very early age, and they could be sold 
and bought like slaves. Women couldn't vote. They couldn't hardly be seen in public. They'd have to wear something over their faces, except every once in a while they could work or get water or draw water. Um, I mean, it was, it was basically, they couldn't talk to men, they couldn't talk to another man, uh, except her, her husband or her friends, if, they, if, if that was okay with him when they were there eating or something. But women were mostly, except for a very, very small percentage, listen now, women at that time, throughout all cultures, okay, all cultures, except for royalty and rare people who had money and so on, women were mostly uneducated, had no education whatsoever, couldn't read, couldn't write, couldn't do any of that kind of stuff. So if they learned anything, it was normally they taught themselves. Women could rarely, if ever, be in business unless it was helping their husband somehow. Uh, women couldn't go to uh, synagogue or the temples except at rare occasions. Maybe some women would be the temple prostitutes, <laughs> but I mean, in some pagan temples, it was for those reasons that women could go. They were used for sex. Many women and young boys became temple prostitutes, sex slaves, so on in those cultures. But most women had no say about who they would marry or anything else because their marriages were arranged and they did not dare say or do anything against it because if they did, they could literally, they had laws about that, they could get themselves in big trouble or worse. So women weren't allowed to sit with the men. Most of the time in any kind of a setting, men would sit with the men and the women with the women, and the women were expected to be quiet. That's what they were expected to be, be quiet, don't talk. And if they did talk, there was bad consequences. So this is who Paul is writing to here. And it would be a culturally unacceptable at that time, <coughs> excuse me, for a woman to speak out in public, to show any disrespect toward her husband or any other man. That would be high, really highly looked down on. So I think you got the picture now. This is where uh, Paul comes in with the gospel. And uh, by the way, have you ever thought about it? The church was the first group of people that allowed women in to worship with the men. So th the church was breaking all the laws. Listen, people talk about how people didn't like the church because they didn't like the way they took communion. They didn't like the way this thing and that thing. But let me tell you what ticked off people more than anything else was the women thing. The church began to honor women. The Apostle Paul began to honor women with his writings as the Holy Spirit moved through him. That ticked off the whole society. I mean, he went against the grain of everything that they said was right. And so the Christian church began to liberate the women while other all the other religions and stuff kept them in that box. So in most cultures of that time, women were just totally controlled by their husband and other men. So you would never see something like this. Someone writing a letter or somebody, uh, a piece of literature, where let's say they're writing a letter and they would uh, write to a, a family, you would never see somebody write a letter and say, well, I'm writing to uh, uh, a certain, uh, let's say Lois and John, right? You would always see them address the man first, always. Never the woman. I just that was disrespectful in those days to do that. Well, the Apostle Paul did that a lot. And so when they read the Apostle Paul's writings, it just went contrary to everything that was done. So when people say Paul was a woman hater, the opposite is true. Can you imagine? And then the Apostle Paul writes about this. He writes something like this. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, using the word agape. He says women or wives should submit to their husbands, yes, but he says the husbands have to agape the wife. 
Now let me tell you what, husbands weren't agaping anything. In, those, in, that, in that generation, the husbands mistreated the wives, and it really wasn't even against the law. We would call it abuse today, some of the stuff they did. But back then, they didn't seem to care. But here comes the Apostle Paul saying, no, the way we do it in the church is the husbands are to love the wife and take care of the wife and take care of her needs. And so he comes along and says that. That just upset the apple cart. And that's why this thing about woman's libs, when they point the, to the Bible and they say, well, the Bible was a book written to hold women down, it's the exact opposite. The exact opposite. So you can see that if you're, if you're smart enough. So, but then comes God on the scene. And, he's, and he really, he, his perfect will was never for it to be like that. God didn't want women to be crushed and broken and beat down and not taken care of and used and abused. That's never been God's will. But the Lord, as wise as he is, understood that as he moved into the world system through the kingdom of God, he changing things like that. And it was the Christians that changed everything that it was going to take time because culture doesn't want to change quickly. And that's why even when, it, when, when Paul speaks to slavery, he, he, it was never God's will for, for, to have slaves. That wasn't God's will. People say, oh, God, he endorsed slavery. No, he didn't, but he spoke into a culture that he wanted to change, but it had to be slow. And so you see him talking about to the slave owners how to treat their slaves as brothers and so on and so forth. You see, so it's not about the Apostle Paul hating women. And by the way, Somebody says, well, the Apostle Paul was never married. Well, I can't prove that he was, but you can't prove that he wasn't. Some Bible scholars believe he was married before he became a Christian because he was a Sanhedrin person, and most of them were wealthy and married and had to be over 30 years old to be in that. And so he probably was, but what might have happened is when he converted, his family, being Jewish, may have rejected him. And so if Paul was married before, he may have been divorced. That's kind of hard for a lot of religious people to understand, but it might be true. But the Apostle Paul, why, wasn't he, why didn't he want to be married? Why did he say the things he said about him not being married? Well, because he knew God, Jesus, showed him the, the many things he's going to have to suffer. And the Apostle Paul did not want to drag a woman into that. I mean, I wouldn't either. That was, what he suffered was way above what, most people would ever suffer today. Not, not there are some, but I wouldn't want to be uh, having a woman have to come with me and, you know, get stoned and beat and shipwrecked and this and that and the other thing. Or how about him having to go out on these trips for three or four or five months and be away? You know, a poor woman, the women uh, uh, in the early church that were married to men that did not travel with them, that had been really hard. Think about that. You don't know whether they're all right. You don't know if they got killed, martyred, um, whether they were, you know, uh, whatever happened to them. You don't know because unlike today, we had all this communication. Back then, it might have took you three or four or five weeks or more to even send a letter somewhere where people could read it. So there you go. That's the culture that this all came into. So through the church, first Jesus, Jesus, if you look in the Gospels, always treated women with respect. He began to move in that area. Then his church, especially Paul's writing, began to free up, began to liberate women from all of these things we talked about. Unfortunately, sometimes people and um, cults and even people today in the church still put women down. But God never will. God does not do that. He loves women he made women the way they are. He made women to be a blessing. He made men to be a blessing. He made them to get married together and have kids and have families. And that's his all, all his idea. Now, Paul uh, probably was married, in my opinion. I mentioned this. He was a popular po a politician. <laughs> you know, it would have been hard for him not to be married because uh, at that time, you know, being one of the jet setters of the time, I guess I could use that term, uh, being as a rich and famous politician as he was, he probably did have a wife. But 
He never married again, that's clear. And he would have to travel and be away a lot. Again, he knew what they would have to suffer. In fact, let's look at some scriptures here. This is interesting. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 again. And let's look at some things here um, that will help us a little bit again to, to start breaking this down. This is just the introduction of this. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, if we go down here to verse uh, 37 is what I want. Now, let's back up before we read that. <clears throat> it might help us. Um, let's go to verse 26. How is it then, brethren? Now, when Paul addresses the church as brethren, he's there's no male or female in his mind. So, brethren also means sister. all right? How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm? Well, is he just talking to the men? Absolutely not. Uh, has a doctrine, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation. He says, let all things be done unto edifying. Then it says in verse 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, <coughs> again, the word man there is not a male, it's um, mankind, okay? Um, let it be by two or at the most three and by course and let one interpret. But if there be no interpreter, let them keep silence in the churches and let God speak to himself, uh, uh, himself and to God. Let the prophet speak, two or three, and let the other judge. If anything's revealed to another that sits by, let them first hold their peace. For you may all, everybody say all. All right, here we go again. Who's he writing to? He's writing to the church. Does that include women? Yes, it does. For ye all may prophesy. Huh, that include women? Because in Acts chapter 2, it talks about God pouring out His Spirit upon all flesh. And it talks about women preaching and prophesying and having visions and just like the men. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace as, as, as all churches of the saints. Now, here's where we, in context, he's talking to the whole church here. Now, he's, he's, he, he's talked about tongues and interpretation, the way we do it prophesying the way we should do it. So he's talking about order in church. And so verse 34 comes along and he says, let your women keep silence in the churches. That doesn't make any sense. He just got through telling them they could participate in anything like that. But when we read it like this, let your wives keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under the uh, obedience as also saith the law. That brings out a little bit more understanding. But let's go on a little bit further. When we look at this verse, if we delve into it a little bit, if you look, if you look at the word silence, it's not a word that means to be uh, just never say anything. It's a word that means to be quiet, to be quiet, to be at peace, not to be overbearing, not to talk out of order, not to talk over people. And by the way, the Apostle Paul is writing this under the influence of the Holy Spirit. This is for today. Because in churches, I just got to say it, and please, I am I love women. I, I want women to be involved. Nobody more than me. But because of the way women are made up, they tend to use a lot more words than men. Have you noticed that? And they tend to want to talk a lot more than men do. Now, it's not always the case, but I'll be sitting up here on Sunday morning, and many times I'll hear something, 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 somebody's talking over my sermon. And I'll turn around, and I'll look, and it's a group of women, two or three of them. And they still haven't learned that that's not right. And so the husband really needs to go to them and say, you know, you need to be quiet. You can't be talking out over the pastor well, it would be the same way if a guy was doing it. We do have men do that, but most of the time, it's women that do that. I'm telling you right now. And so that's what he's talking about. He says, let the wives 
you know, not interrupt the church service. For it is not permitted unto them to speak, the word speak here again, misinterpreted, to speak or to speak out a turn or to speak, um, I guess you could say a bunch of gibberish, you know, or even, even really, it can include even other tongues just to be blasting off in other tongues in the middle of the sermon and disrupting the flow of the service or disrupting in, uh, so people couldn't hear. That's that type of thing. It's very clear in the Greek. But they are commanded to be under obedience, also says the law. And then in verse 35, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Why? Because the wives were uneducated. They couldn't read the Bible. They couldn't read the scriptures. And they certainly didn't understand a lot of this. They never even, some of them never even been in a public gathering where they were teaching. And so they had questions. But he says, that's fine to have a question, but don't disrupt the rest of the people in the service with your question. And so they can't, under, uh, so there's chaos in there. Save your question, go home and ask your husband. Now that's very clear. That's very clear. And then verse 36 says, What came the word of God out from you or came uh, unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge these things that are right to you uh, uh, are the commandments of the Lord. So there you go. That's all he's saying in that. All he's saying is let's not disrupt the service because by talking. Now another thing too, in many congregations today, it's like that overseas still, You'll have the women sitting in one section and the men sitting in the other. So if you have a husband and a wife, they're way away from each other. You certainly didn't want the wife waving at her husband and say, hey, what did that mean? You know. And so Paul was simply saying there are etiquettes and we are to be reverent and we are to worship God uh, in decency and in order. And that's what that's all about. It has really nothing to do with shutting women up. Completely. No, no, no. He, in the whole chapter before that, he talked about all of us getting involved. Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and, and worship and prayer and so on. We're all free to do that. There are no male or female. So that's important. Then if we look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we'll see something else here. If you look down at verse 25, people use this scripture here in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Many of them look at this scripture and they say, well, Paul was against marriage. Paul hated women. Paul this and that and the other thing. Well, let's read it and see what it says. Verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that obtains mercy from the Lord to be faithful. All right. Now, what the Apostle Paul is saying, I'm giving you my personal opinion about this. All right. Uh, so that's important that you understand that. Verse 26. I suppose, therefore, that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loose from a wife? Seek not to be not a wife. But, and if you marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she has not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. But I spare you, or I'm trying to spare you of that. But this I say, brethren, that time is short. It remains that both of them should uh, that uh, have wives be as though they had not. So this is important, and I, and I got to tell you, I, I agree totally with the Apostle Paul here. Too much, I think, is made out of just young women having to find a husband or um, young men having to find a wife. They think that somehow that's going to make them happy. That's going to, uh, you know, uh, going to cause them to be fulfilled in life. And certainly marriage is great in the right situation with the right person. But it also could be hell on earth if you pick the wrong person. And so this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about. At that particular time, Christians were being thrown to the lions for God's sakes. You know, and he was saying, you know, whatever you do, whether you be a man or a woman, single or married, you keep your eyes on the Lord. 
I don't know how many times I have seen as a pastor working in churches for 45 years, listen to me now, where when somebody got married, it caused that person, whether male or female, to all of a sudden almost disappear from the, from the assembly because all of a sudden now they're doing other things and their wife wants to do this and their husband wants to go here and they want to do this. So it's very, very important for, for when, we, when we counsel people on marriage to let them know that there's going to be an issue that comes up between you and your husband or wife and God that is going to have to be dealt with. And that is, we need to keep, give him first place and keep him there. I just see it all the time. I see it right now. Right as I'm sitting here in this church, I see, I see that, 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 that thing working where, you know, the, maybe the wife is not turned on as much as the husband, so they want to go somewhere else, or the husband's not as turned on to the wife, so he wants to go somewhere else and wants to stay home, and, you know, and so they yield to that because they're married now instead of keeping their focus on the Lord. It's the same way. Uh, in, in just in, in many different situations, uh, when when somebody gets married and they have children, it's the same way. Children can all of a sudden you got like four ball games a week, you know, and you start missing church services and you stop praying as much as you used to. You get your you get your eyes on all kind of other stuff, and it happens all the time. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all the Apostle Paul is saying there. He's just saying you need to think about this. And I'm an old man. I've been around a while. He's saying, I think a lot of you just be better not even getting married. And I would say the same thing. Don't get married until you absolutely know the Lord is moving you together. And then when you do get married, you need to understand and have some principles under your belt because it's not going to be like you think it is. It's going to be difficult and challenging and a lot of work. So hallelujah, I'm on my soapbox. And I'm going to stop there because that's a good place to stop since I probably ticked some people off at that particular point. But I appreciate you tuning into this. Now, this is my first lesson. We're going to do some more lessons today. And we're going to have a, I don't know how many of these we'll do, but we'll do it till the end. Then we'll go on to other subjects. But um, uh, if you like this and you're getting anything out of it, I would highly suggest on this one, highly suggest that you get it around especially the people that have been taught differently than this, because this will liberate people and get them set free. It's common sense, really. And uh, everything I'm telling you when I say the Greek and this and that, I know that I'm not giving you the Greek words and stuff. I really don't want to do that. I don't really care I just about that. I, I do want you to trust me enough, and you go check it out. It's fine. You check it out. You'll find the same thing. Trust me enough to have studied this all these years to give you those interpretations. Because that's basically the truly what it means. He's not telling women they can't speak. He's telling women to speak the right way, to be peaceful, to be quiet. We'll talk about that later. But if you like this, please share it. If you'd like to become a partner with us, you can go down there. It's a link. You can get involved with tithes and offerings toward our ministry. If, you, if this is your church and uh, you're, you're out there and you don't have a church home, and, you're, and well, you can tithe. Right there, you can just go over to PayPal or to our website, faithoflifefellowship.org. You're going to find all kinds of seminars and teachings and stuff on YouTube. It's all those links are there. And we really appreciate uh, you considering being a partner, praying for us and partnering with us. We, we could use it for this fruitful ministry. The more money we have coming in, the more we can do. Till next time, God bless you. We love you.